It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Jerry Udelson from the United States. Uh, Mr. Jerry Udelson, he was one of the original lead uh, trainers for the U.S. Green Building Council. He was also a former board member for the USGBC. He also has chaired the USGBC's annual conference, um, which is the biggest green build conference in the United States. Um, Jerry is the author of 12 books on green buildings, green homes, and green development, including three that was released last year, one of which, Green Building Trends in Europe, should be of great interest of this audience. His new book, Dry Run, Preventing the Next Urban Water Crisis, is due out later this spring. Jerry's firm, Udelson Associates, in Tucson, Arizona, the United States, offers green building consulting services, sustainability planning, and contract research services. Re Jerry is also a registered professional engineer with more than 25 plus experience. He holds engineering degrees from Caltech and Harvard University and an MBA with highest honors from the University of Oregon. Please join me with a warm Central, Central and Eastern European welcome to Jerry Udelson. Thank you, Amola, and, and good morning, everyone. Hopefully, uh, some of you who have flown here from far and wide are awake. My goal as a speaker is always to see more eyeballs than eyelids. So hopefully, we can keep everyone awake in the morning. I've had a chance to be in this beautiful city for the past three days, and it's um, a great place to have this first meeting. So let's begin and talk about the business case for green building. As Jane was mentioning, this is about something that is beneficial to business. It's something we all want to see happen. But it isn't going to happen just by government fiat or by wishing it so. There has to be benefits to all parties. So what I'm going to try to do in today's presentation is to give you some of the reasons why business is adopting this green building standard worldwide. Before I launch the presentation, I always like to take advantage of the fact that you want to know what's coming. And so uh, this is a preview of coming attractions. The takeaways, something you can take away from the presentation. You, you're going to hear many times about the importance of green building, particularly energy efficient building, in controlling global CO2 emissions. Um, you should also know that green design and development is here to stay. I've been chronicling lead statistics, uh, registrations under the USGBC lead system, since about 2002. And what you will see, I'll give you one brief statistic, I'm sure Scott Horst will have many others, is that even during the worst economic times in memory, green buildings were still growing last year on a cumulative basis by 70%. Think of that. While commercial construction in the U.S. was down 30% and down worldwide and for the most part, green buildings were growing and gaining market share. And so we're still having, uh, right now, something Scott maybe has some updated numbers, more than 1,300 new projects a month announcing their intention to pursue LEED certification. And these are from about 70 different countries. So you shouldn't think that LEED is just a U.S. system. It can be adapted and used in many countries. What I also want to communicate is that no matter what type of building you're building, whether it's a commercial office building, a corporate headquarters, a school, a, a public building, the benefits of green buildings are significant for all building types, but they are different for all building types. I had a chance to work for two years with the International Council of Shopping Centers which has a modest 70,000 corporate members. And I looked into the retail industry and wrote a book for them that was published by Springer last year. 
If you look at sustainable retail development, which my German friends tell me is a, what we call oxymoron, self-canceling term, I say, well, how can shopping be sustainable? Um, you see that the business case for green retail development is very different than the business case for green office development. So I would just encourage you to understand when you learn sort of the different business cases that not everything is going to apply for every type of building. For example, a public building doesn't really care about rents. A public building doesn't really care about increasing the value of the building, but a private developer certainly does. So different uh, things. The other thing I'll close my talk with in uh, a few minutes is to give you the idea that water is becoming the next major focus of green building in much of the world. And there are some good reasons for this. There's also a very strong connection between water and energy that requires that they both be dealt with simultaneously. So we mentioned that green buildings are important for carbon reduction around the world. We can obviously see those numbers. But I think what's really interesting is that investing in energy efficient buildings is the only significant solution to carbon emissions that pays for itself. In other words, you become wealthier right away by investing in energy efficient buildings. And that's really important because if it's economically viable to do this and people aren't doing it, it becomes more an issue of finance than economics, right? How do I pay for it versus is it a good idea? And as much as 25% of the total carbon solution can come from buildings. So this is a significant activity with global implications that we're all engaged in. We also talk often in sustainability about the triple bottom line. In English, it's very nice. We can make three Ps, people, planet, profit. We also say ecology, economics, and then we search for the third E, but sometimes we say ethics. Um, but it is about people. We cannot see buildings just as carbon emitters that have to be reduced. Buildings are built for people to be in. They're built for people to be healthy in, to be productive in. And so I think it's very important that architects, engineers, and everyone else engaged in green building understand and, and respond to the fact that this is about people. I had a chance to visit a, a very significant green building project here in Budapest called, from the Panon uh, mobile phone company. And what was interesting about the building is not just the energy efficient features with geothermal heating and stormwater management and all the nice things they had there, but they are also pioneering new ways to work that make people more productive, happier at work, the building has tremendous daylighting, but it's not just about the daylighting. It's about the human systems that integrate with the building systems. We also have academic studies from around the world, uh, peer-reviewed studies that talk about the, the proven benefits of green buildings. You can read some of these, but we are beginning to see significant data in the commercial sector on rental rate increases for green buildings, increases in occupancy, increases in office productivity, even retail sales on a per square foot, per square meter basis, and reductions in absenteeism, energy costs, water costs, and so forth. So you should know that there is a lot of data out there supporting this business case. What I find interesting, though, is that most professionals I encounter in the United States, particularly architects, engineers, builders, or construction people, cannot articulate the business case. And therefore, they're not as effective in persuading clients to adopt these approaches. So I would encourage you, even though you have professional specialties in different areas, to go beyond your specialties and really understand how your client's business or operations work so that you can be more effective in convincing them to go in this direction. Because that, I think, is in, in my work, is, is one of the issues that is very important. Now, in terms of the importance of building green, in the US, because we are still adding 100 million more people to our population over the next 40 years, whereas in Europe, you're pretty much static in population, um, 
we will have 75% of our buildings will either be new or renovated over the next 30 years. So we have great opportunities. Here I think the focus is much more likely to be on renovations, refurbishments, interiors, and uh, the work in greening existing buildings. So last year I, I was able to write a book called Greening Existing Buildings where I chronicled what ha is happening in the United States in the existing building arena, which is after all, in any given year, 98 or 99 percent of all the stuff that's out there, right? So if we don't work on existing buildings, we're never going to get the energy uh, reductions, carbon reductions that we're after. I also want to give you the sense that green building is growing rapidly. And one of the analogies I like to make is uh, many of us have flown here for this meeting. And if you watch an airplane taking off, you would swear the first half of the takeoff, it will never get in the air, right? There is this very kind of gradual increase in speed. And then all of a sudden, fortunately, about halfway down the runway, the acceleration takes place. And at about 220 kilometers per hour, the wheels are turned up and off we go. So it's important to realize that you might get started and think you're not going anywhere. For example, here are the USGBC statistics on lead project registrations. The numbers aren't so important, but look at the flight path. Until about 2005 or, or even 2006, the growth was steady but not remarkable. Of course, remarkable on a percentage basis because you started with such a small base, but not much was happening. And then about the time of Al Gore's movie, uh, Inconvenient Truth, things started to change. There was a real change in the German word zeitgeist, right? The spirit of the times. And all of a sudden, everybody began to say, we should be doing this, but particularly the commercial building sector. So in 2005, 6, and 7, the fastest growing lead system was for core and shell buildings, in other words, commercial office buildings. In 2000, seven, eight, and nine, the fastest growing system began to be greening existing buildings. So you see this will happen in phases. We always focus on new construction because it's easier to do green buildings than new construction. But look at this growth path. In the construction industry, you don't see, in the property industry, you don't see this kind of growth path. So what it says is green buildings are taking market share. One of the influential American experts in this area, Gregory Katz, has just published a book, um, I believe the title is Greening Our Buildings. But what he is basically proposing and predicting is that by 2020, 2020, 95% of all new buildings will be built to green building standards in the US. In other words, it will be a complete transformation. So that's very significant, and about 80 80% of new buildings that are refurbished will be built to green building standards. So you will see over the coming decade tremendous opportunities. So in your own countries, and I'll give you statistics uh, right here, this is what I was able to get from the USGBC's uh, database. These are registrations under the US LEED system. A, a little under 60 projects, 47 of those were new construction, either core and shell or new construction. So still a focus on, on that area. And two countries uh, have really dominated the, the numbers, uh, Poland and Hungary. So congratulations to those people. But I would say it's really important to finish the process. Because so far, we could only find two projects that were certified under the US standard and one under the UK standard, BREAM. Well, let's go on to green buildings make money sense. Green buildings make money sense. Here is a headquarters in Boston for the Genzyme company, which is a, a large biotech company. Uh, and this was designed by Benish Architects from Stuttgart, Germany. What's interesting about this building, about 900 people work in this building. It's a corporate headquarters. It's in the sort of Harvard, MIT area uh, of Boston. And you can imagine that a company that's in the knowledge business has a great demand for skilled workers. And you may not know that Boston is a, a locus in the United States for the biotech industry, one of two or three major places. So that this company is always competing for employees 
with other similar companies in the area. This building was completed and at the time was the largest lead platinum building in the United States in 2004. I visited in 2008. Since they opened the building, they have recorded 5% less turnover in employees. I know turnover might mean revenues in Europe, but 5% fewer employees leaving the company every year. Now multiply the numbers, 900 employees times 5%, 45 people leaving, not leaving the company compared to before. It costs in the U.S. at least $50,000 to replace an employee in terms of hiring costs, lost productivity, and so forth. So it's worth about $2.25 million to the company, or about $65 per square meter, if you want to do the numbers. Now, if the building cost 5% more, that would have been about $75 per square meter. In other words, if you just look at the employee hiring cost from not having to hire new employees, that pays for the building in one year. Forget energy use, forget water use savings, forget waste management savings, forget everything else. For a corporate headquarters, just the reduction in employee changeover is significant enough to pay for the entire building in one year. This is a great building, by the way. It has tremendous daylighting, natural ventilation. All of the good design ideas from Germany were brought to this building. So this we see replicated over and over in the single tenant corporate building sector. So a very important idea to keep in mind. Not one that is obvious. Not one that architects would talk about with their clients but the most significant business benefit of this particular building. So I think it's very important that we as design professionals, construction professionals, always remember the business or the activity that our client is engaged in and make our presentation not just on good architecture, not just on energy savings and reducing carbon emissions, but on the things that drive that business. And so you can see there's a lot of business case. So here, the financial and economic return was based on reduction in employee hiring costs. You can also have a return based on energy savings, water savings, waste management savings. You can also have risk management or risk mitigation savings. For example, in the United States now, insurance companies are being required by all of the different state governments, that's how we regulate insurance, are being required to disclose their exposure to climate change as part of their public disclosures. They, in turn, are asking their insured customers, what are you doing to combat the effects of climate change? And green buildings is one of the responses. A number of insurance companies are now giving 5% reduced costs for insurance, commercial insurance, to buildings that are certified under LEED. So again, you could see a direct business benefit Obviously, there are marketing and public relations benefits. We visited on uh, Tuesday an office building out near the airport here that is the only, uh, we, we understand, the only BREEAM certified uh, office or any, any project here in Hungary. And in all of their marketing materials is this is a BREEAM very good building. So you see there are, there are marketing benefits. In the U.S., these are quite significant because all of the lead registered buildings are in a database that is used by property agents or, or property brokers to find space for their customers. So you begin to see this business ecosystem in place, right? You're a corporation, you have a global corporation, you have sustainability goals, right? You tell your real estate people that wherever we are in every city in the world, we want to be in a green certified space. That agent or broker goes on a database. They start looking for that. In the US, it's now well organized. You can find a, an energy efficient building registered. You can find a LEED certified building on a common database used by all property agents. So then the person who owns that property is getting a marketing benefit because they don't have to compete with every office 
in the city, they only have to compete with the ones that are registered, certified, or labeled. And so they say, well, this is very good. And then, of course, somebody else builds one nearby. And then they say, well, for my next project, it has to be at a higher level, right? So we have in the UK, you have the Bream, outstanding, excellent. And where's Paul King? He's there. Paul, I think the next level for Bream will be splendid. <laughs> I think that will be the next level of certification, just to keep going higher. Um, we have productivity and health benefits. I'll show you a chart on that in a minute. Recruitment and retention of key employees. Obviously, in the current economic time, it's a little easier to hire people. But remember, good people drive companies forward. And so companies are always looking for good people, particularly good young people. And young people care about this issue of the planet. They care about their careers. They care about sustainability in a big way. If you can offer that, you have an opportunity to hire better. There are, of course, policy directives from government. Availability of investment capital. So more and more uh, pension funds are investing only in green real estate. There's a whole movement worldwide, responsible property investing, which is driving this forward with investment in new projects. So you can begin to see this kind of business ecosystem at work. And it's what we might call a virtuous cycle. You all know of a vicious cycle, right? A virtuous cycle, doing one good thing generates another good thing. And that's, in fact, what's happening. And of course, we have global sustainability concerns by companies, by governments, by NGOs. I wanted to give you a few numbers. I, I did spend eight years in engineering school, and so I would have to bring data. And here's one of my favorite quotations from the uh, American uh, expert in quality control. In God we trust, all others must bring data. So here are some data. These are Energy Star, which is a national energy efficient rating of the top 25% of buildings in various categories for their energy use. $26 per square meter rent premium, 3.6% higher occupancy. So that means if occupancy was 85% in non-certified buildings, it's 88.6% in certified buildings. Selling price increased $66 per square meter. That's for the energy only labeled buildings. For the LEED certified buildings, and this is a database of about 1,000 buildings, $122 per square meter, rent premium, 4.1% higher occupancy. Look at the increase in sales price, almost $2,000 per square meter. There is now a, a, a academic publication called Journal of Sustainable Real Estate, which you can find, and, and if you're interested, order. It's published at Clemson University. It has begun collecting all of these studies. So again, these are not definitive data, but they are very suggestive. And if you are a leader in the business sector, the leader, you don't wait for all the data to come in. Leaders take action. We have a saying in the United States, some of you may have seen in Alaska, the uh, dog sleds that are pulled over the snow by dogs. We have a saying that only the dog in front has a change of scenery. Every other dog must look at the back of the dog in front of him. So leaders in the property industry don't wait for all the data to come in. They take action. And that's what's happening around the world. Here are some data that are current through the fourth quarter of 2009. Now remember, this is the worst climate for uh, commercial real estate that anyone can remember. And so you see that the average rent is decreasing between fourth quarter 2008 and fourth quarter 2009, but that the premium for lead buildings is still holding steady at about 10% for rents. And these are rents that are reported on a national database. This is as good information as you're going to get anywhere. So I just want to give you the sense that this is a phenomenon that is very resilient with respect to economic conditions. Now we're beginning to see a kind of loosening up of the commercial real estate markets. People are starting to develop space again. So you can see this will continue in the future. Here are the occupancy rates versus the peers. Um, 
what's been happening is that LEED certified buildings against similar buildings, same cities, close by, that the occupancy rate gap has actually been increasing. So that you can see nominally about 5% um, uh, difference in occupancy. So again, very robust uh, numbers. The, uh, uh, in, in the UK, the uh, RICS study, Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, studied almost 1,000 buildings using researchers at uh, University of Maastricht in the Netherlands and UC Berkeley, University of California at Berkeley. Their conclusion, effective rent 6% higher, sales pr price 16% higher, and that if you upgraded your building to green building standards, you would add about 5.5 million to the average value. So again, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to take this data and do something with it. Well, what's the relevance here? As Jane mentioned, not only are green building councils worldwide, but green building is worldwide, and the uptake, the increase, is very rapid. What's interesting, too, if you deal just with the commercial property sector, is that it's very similar in many European countries. Uh, property developers from Western Europe are developing in this region, responding to the same business dynamics. You have to get money from investors, and you have to invest it profitably on their behalf. Global companies want green spaces, so the global sustainability concerns where you have most of the 1,000 largest companies around the world issuing sustainability reports, they want to be in green spaces, so that's a driving force. Investors want green buildings because they think they will hold their value better. And there's a convergence of techniques, materials, and systems. Imola mentioned I had written a book yesterday called Green Building Trends in Europe. It actually wasn't written for you. It was written for my colleagues in the United States so that they would understand what they could learn from this region in the way of building systems, approaches, and so forth. So I see this convergence going on in Australia, in the US, in Europe. It's happening worldwide. So we're beginning to figure out how to do these things. Now, if you look at a business, most of the costs of a business are people costs, right? 70 to 80% of the cost of business in the knowledge economy is just people. And about 5% is rent, and, and 1 or 2% is energy. So you can see you can't just focus on energy as a way to drive things forward. You have to demonstrate that buildings with great daylighting, with good indoor air quality, and so forth, are going to be more productive. So people cost is about 100 times energy and about 10 times rent. When I first saw this chart, it was a revolution, a revelation for me, really, because it showed why the focus on people is so important, because a 1% gain in productivity pays for all the energy bills. So we struggled to get 30, 40, 50% energy savings, but a 1% gain in productivity, which is not difficult, pays for the whole energy bill. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do the energy upgrades. It means there are other drivers. A 10% gain in productivity pays for the entire building. And we're seeing 3 to 7% gains in workplace productivity in green buildings. So again, this is an easy decision once you present the data to the right decision makers. One of my colleagues at the USGBC years ago said to me something I, I've certainly remembered. He said, the most important thing you can do is in the first hour of the first meeting of any new building project. When you set the goals, the broad goals, what is this building for? What do you want to achieve here? What do you want to be most proud of five and 10 years from now? When that discussion happens with the right decision makers in the room, then the rest of it is easy. If you wait until you're two months into design to have a discussion about green building, you've lost 80 or 90 percent of the opportunities. Marketing public relations, what we've seen in the U.S. is that LEED has become a brand. Something like soup or chocolate. When someone says, I'm doing a LEED building, people think that is a better building. And in fact, it is. So LEED has become a brand. The same thing is happening with Bream in the UK, with the uh, DGNB system, with Green Star in Australia and New Zealand. It's a brand that people can respond to. It's our job to make the brand mean something. 
Many European projects, of course, are registered under the U.S. lead system, a lot of them by global companies and organizations. And what happens now is that you can do green pretty much on a conventional budget if you manage the process right. Here's a project in Stuttgart from Heinz, which is a global property developer based in Houston, Texas. This is a lead for core and shale gold pre-certification. This is actually a refurbishment, complete refurbishment of a building, so you can see the details there. So in the U.S. now, we, are, we have registered over 4,000, maybe close to 5,000 under the lead for existing building system. Now, these are not small buildings. The average size is in excess of 25,000 square meters. And some of them are quite large, the Empire State Building in New York City. Many of you may have seen the Sears Tower, or now called Willis Tower in Chicago. So again, very large projects can be done this way. What's the meaning for this area? Green certifications add value beyond the energy savings. Really important, we're adding value. You can take older spaces and rebrand them. This space here obviously doesn't need to be rebranded. It is a wonderful building on the world level. But most older buildings do. Large global companies want green office space, including in this region. Payback or return on investment typically is one to two years on direct uh, incremental cost. And for most developers and building owners, the bigger issue is preventing the erosion of value in their existing properties. So if you're called in to do a refurbishment project, you should be talking to those people about, you know, we're going to do green on this project. We're going to do a certification to whatever system you choose, because this will not only be a, a better building, but you will prevent erosion of value, because all around you, new buildings are going to be built to this standard. Let's talk briefly about water. Here's a chart of global water consumption over 125 year period projected to 2025. And you could see it's going up and obviously biggest increases in Asia because of population growth. But more importantly is the connection between water and energy. And so here are uh, a few ideas. It takes water to make energy. Every thermal power plant, including nuclear, takes water. Concentrating solar power, which is currently the cheapest way to make energy from the sun, takes lots of water because it's essentially a thermal power plant. It takes energy to make water. It takes energy for water treatment, pumping, and sewage disposal. In California, 19% of all electricity, one-fifth of all electricity goes to water, something you might not think about. Desalination plants obviously take lots of water. I was in Doha in Qatar on the weekend giving a talk. All the water for that country is desalted. It's fortunate for them they have the eighth largest reserves of oil and gas in the world. They use lots of energy to make water. Well, we've done studies in the U.S. There's not enough water for future energy needs. There's not enough energy for future water needs under current technologies and approaches. So the opportunity for innovation in this sector is very dramatic. So I have coined a term called nega gallons. You may have heard of nega watts from Amory Levins. The energy savings from, or the, the savings from energy conservation is equivalent to megawatts. So I've coined the term nega gallons are the cheapest solution. Not only that, I just finished a book on water. I did the research. It's the cheapest form of energy conservation is saving water in our buildings. Think about that. It, it, it's, it's not a huge cost, but it's the cheapest way to save energy. So my conclusion is that uh, urban water crises are likely to increase. In Europe, you have issues here with hotter summers, colder winters, more of the rainfall falling as, or more of the precipitation falling as rain than as snow, right? So if we have uh, ra rivers coming from the Alps, for example, we have relied for centuries on the melting of the snow during the summer to provide summer water. What happens if that's less snow and more rain, we have bigger spring floods, less summer uh, runoff or stream flow. So what I've found is that good design and practice can reduce water use 50% in buildings and in retrofits perhaps even more. So 
what should be the design standard. So one of the things I looked at in the research for this book, wherever you have cooling towers for uh, buildings, you use a lot of water, unnecessarily a lot of water. So the important thing is to match the water quality with the intended use. For example, in office buildings or public buildings, we can use the gray water, the water from sinks and showers and basins, non-toilet water, but everything else. We can use that for cooling. Why is that a good idea? Because the more people there are in the building, the more cooling is required, right? But there also the more gray water is generated. So you can treat that. So I, I visited a bank in Frankfurt, uh, KFW in English, uh, KFW in German, and they have gray water systems for the large bank building retrofitted in the basement, and uh, it works very well. So our U.S. good practice is about 600 liters a year per square meter. Australian is about 400 without cooling towers. German averages, not best practice, average is 200. So either the Germans don't bathe a lot, or they have figured out how to design this into their buildings. So what is the future here? Well, here's a quote from a, a research paper from Deutsche Bank Research that just came out this week. Uh, Tenant demand and superior environmental performance are major driving factors in making green buildings mainstream. However, stricter government regulation in the EU is likely the reason for green buildings to become the de facto standard for new and renovated buildings in 10 years. So you have a combination of both a business case and a policy case, but it will happen in any case. So the future is green. In football, if you want to score, you have to run to where the ball is headed, right? Not to where it is today. Um, and so you have to ask yourself, ask your clients, how green will the built environment be in 2015? What will be the new normal? And how is it that non-certified buildings can avoid paying a significant market penalty for not being green certified? So that is my message for today. The future is green. We have to run as fast as this industry is moving forward. I thank you very much. Uh, we we have uh, five minutes for questions. If Hi, Joey. Uh, thanks for the, for the talk and taking the time to come here. Um, I have a certain issue with, obviously, um, as, a, as a consultant, obviously convincing certain investors and clients as to the merits of green building. Now, you mentioned um, productivity um, and certain gains through um, the, the, the project in Boston that you mentioned. Playing devil's advocate, I would sort of come back to you and suggest that prove your figures that is purely due to the green building that productivity has risen. Because you've taken that without putting it into context that there's maybe there's some social changes, some employment regulation changes. And I think it's quite easy for us to say, do a green building and productivity will rise without actually putting in, you know, you sort of your neck on the block and saying, we can actually prove this because I, I don't think you actually can. So, so, so the, as I understand the question is, all right, we say people are more productive. We've measured this. There are about 200, actually 350 now, academic studies from around the world that have been collected by a U.S. university, Carnegie Mellon. They've been further vetted or peer-reviewed uh, after being peer-reviewed, published. You can go on the website for Carnegie Mellon it's called the uh, Building Investment Decision Support System, or BIDS, B-I-D-S. Um, and you could search BIDS and LEAD, and you can find these studies. So I think as a professional, it's our obligation to present the information to clients. You say, listen, this is not my data, but it's data you should know about before you make this decision. And by the way, we believe we can bring in a certified uh, BREAM excellent or outstanding building for X percent cost increment. Now, you can't guarantee anything because I have observed by participating on a variety of design teams that process management is just as important as technical skill in getting these results. And so what I've observed is that if you don't <clears throat> manage the process correctly, you won't get the 
results, the cost results, because as everyone is involved in building design and construction knows, cost is real and immediate, right? Benefits are speculative and in the future. And in that situation, our natural decision-making approach is to focus on cost. So I think it's equally important to take these business case benefits and put them into the model for the project from the beginning so that you're always looking at benefit and cost. Because if you just focus on cost, you basically throw out everything that costs more. The other thing I would say is that integrated design or integrated project delivery systems are very important, and particularly to reduce the need for air conditioning in buildings because the mechanical systems or the building service systems are the ones that really uh, drive cost, and they're the easiest to change if you design the building well. So for 50 years, engineers in the United States have been fat, dumb, and lazy because they had air conditioning. So no matter how poorly the architect designed the building, they could still make it work, right? Just add more air conditioning. That era is gone. That doesn't work anymore. It doesn't work from a cost point of view. It doesn't work from a carbon point of view. But what we haven't learned is how to work together. They're sort of like a dysfunctional family, you know, engineers and architects, certainly in the US. And so we really need to focus on process management because without engineering support, we can't get better buildings on the same budget. And I keep coming back to that same budget. You need to have champagne on a beer budget. You need to have much better buildings for the same cost. Otherwise, this doesn't work. So there's a lot of work ahead of us to learn how to do this. And I think many of us know how. Many of us have been doing this. But it's a matter of transferring it into the broader base. And so that's what I think the real task ahead is, is educating professionals, owners, everyone engaged in this property industry. Sir. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you for a really inspiring uh, presentation. And uh, so I would like to have your, your reaction to some kind of uh, a feeling that built up while I listened to your presentation. Uh, so you referred a lot to, to lead and, and uh, to, to these experiences. And then at the end, you gave these figures about uh, water use per square meter and year. Uh, you can come up with the same figures for, for energy consumption for the different countries, which would look probably very similar. And uh, so uh, the question that, that arises to me in, in that context is, isn't there the blind breaching of talking about color? And uh, isn't, isn't this whole idea of, of transferring something from the US who have the worst standards, a uh, worst practice globally to Europe who typically have better practices, isn't that absurd? Well, let me take your question in a positive context, <laughs> which is what I am advocating for, what I tried to show in the book about European green building trends was that we have to move away from the idea of relative improvement. So it's as if you go in the confessional and you have sinned, and now you're sinning less. As Bill McDonough, the architect, says, we have to get from going being less bad to being really good. And therefore, I advocate that as we look to revising our green building standards in the US, that we focus on absolute performance. Now, that gets a bit difficult because there are so many different building types. You have to say, well, does it have a cooling tower? Does it have a data center, et cetera? You have to sort out those things. But the standards that my German engineering friends like to talk about for heating, cooling, lighting, hot water, and electricity, or lighting, excuse me, is 100 kilowatt hours a year per square meter, primary energy use. So energy use at the power plant. It'll be different in Switzerland because they have more hydropower than it will be in Hungary. But if you focus on that, now you're really dealing with carbon emissions. And so I believe that the evolution of green building standards will be towards relative performance and away from, excuse me, uh, towards absolute performance and away from relative improvement. And certainly, we have a lot to learn from every part of the world how to do that. The Australians have really 
pioneered the water conservation area in many ways because they've been in the worst drought in their history for almost a decade. So we can learn from each other. And the US designers can learn from European numbers as well. So I, I think this convergence that's happening around the world is very healthy. And we don't have to have any pride about our national approaches. We can say, all right, how did they get 100 kilowatts? Because the US average is 400 kilowatt hours per year per square meter on site use. So you say, well, gee, that's a lot of difference. How did they do that? OK, one thing you find, for example, is that design fees are 50% higher in the UK, for example, than in the US. So more money is put in at the beginning to get better results. So again, we have to deal with that issue, which is you have more time for studies, more time for competitions, et cetera, than we do. So again, I like absolute performance as a metric. I think that's the only thing that really counts in the long run, and, and we'll sort of find our way there over time. I, unfortunately, I must leave to go to the airport, but I want to thank my hosts and, and uh, Steve uh, Bornkamp particularly for putting this conference together and all of you for attending. Thank you once again.